When you look through a telescope, no matter how impressive, the Earth's atmosphere refracts the light of incoming stars, making it impossible to make out a clear image. This problem has plagued astronomical research, obscuring detail. Because of the atmosphere, we were limited in our resolution of these systems. We could make bigger and more sophisticated telescopes, but we couldn't get any better resolution. The problem that Michael Lafrave, an adaptive optics engineer at the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona, describes could only be solved by getting the telescopes above the Earth's atmosphere. But telescopes like Hubble are expensive. Although to see past the atmospheric disturbance has been a dream of astronomers since the 50s, it has only been in the last 20 years that they have been able to do so. The secret? A technology called adaptive optics changed the way we looked at the sky forever. Adaptive optics was first dreamed up by Horace Babcock in the 1950s. His theory was that if you could use deformable mirrors to compensate for the distorted incoming light, then you could create a clear, focused image. Uh, what adaptive optics does is in real time, it actually sharpens the images. So you see detail which you could only see for if you were above the atmosphere otherwise. Astronomers would need a deformable mirror, one that splits the light into smaller parts and then hits the sensors, making the corrections. The technology would take a lot of money, something the astronomers of the time just did not have. But the development of this technology has a history wrapped in secrecy, politics, and the tumultuous Cold War. It's 1983, President Reagan sits in office, and mutual assured destruction has kept tensions with the Soviet Union at a peak since the advent of the atomic bomb. What was keeping both nations safe was the fragile understanding that if you push that big red button, we push that big red button, and no one can win. Throughout the arms race, 70,000 nuclear weapons had been built up between both sides. While disarmament was in discussion in the START talks in the late 70s and early 80s, the world was still on edge while MAD reigned. On March 23, 1983, Reagan proposes the Strategic Defense Initiative, known to the public as Star Wars. Reagan anticipated a new world of defense and employed the nation's top scientists to make it a reality. Money would now be pouring into defense, and therefore, new technology. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. We had essentially um, signed a treaty saying we wouldn't knock out foreign satellites, but uh, we didn't say we wouldn't test devices that were capable of doing so. The Department of Defense took Horace Babcock's ideas and saw how they could be applied to their own purposes. So then the Air Force was very interested in being able to image objects from the ground using ground-based telescopes, and specifically the objects of interest were, were foreign satellites, spy satellites. So now Horace Babcock's dream was coming true, and things were looking up for the astronomers, right? The military very unwisely declared the whole thing to be secret. This is Freeman Dyson, a physicist responsible for early adaptive optics theoretical research and a part of the Jason team, a group of top-tier scientists working for the United States government. It was very difficult to, to do anything either inside or outside that made sense. The people on the inside were not interested really in the science at all. They just wanted to have an operational system they didn't want to know anything more about the atmosphere. And the people on the outside were totally turned off because they said, well, since the military is spending billions and billions on this, it's pointless for us to spend our little hard-earned astronomical money. As the 80s came to a close, SEI was largely considered a failure by the public. However, for the astronomical community, the systems that they had envisioned were now possible and so close to their grasp. We were tearing down the Berlin Wall in 1989, and by 1992, uh, virtually all the, the sovereign states of Russia had declared independence from Russia. And so hey, the climate between the U.S. and Russia had greatly changed. 
there was a there was a great push from the National Science Foundation urging the Department of Defense to to share this information freely. Claire Max got involved. She was by that time a Jason, and she pushed in two directions. First of all, to get the thing declassified, and she persuaded after a lot of very careful diplomacy. She persuaded the Air Force that they were not going anywhere unless they had the thing out in the open. All along, I wanted it to be used on every astronomical telescope. A number of us were convinced that they should just declassify it. I and my colleagues in the Jason were pushing a letter up, and I don't know exactly what happened at the top when they met. The result was that there was a very spectacular meeting of the American Astronomical Society in the early 90s, where scientists got up and exposed the whole thing to the astronomy community. Excitement in the air, that's the best way I can describe it. The astronomers had been seeking this knowledge. They, 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 they probably had glimpses of what was happening. They, they heard rumors, but they didn't have access to the classified documents. Now all that classification had been stripped. The conference was just a continuous buzz of conversation between all parties, both you know foreign nationals as well as U.S. citizens. And it was, it was really an exciting time. It's that release of the Air Force information back in the 1990s that allowed a lot of progress to be made in other areas. The astronomy community is now at, at virtually every large astronomical facility in the world. Adaptive optics exists or it's in their line items for future development. With the advent of adaptive optics, we are now able to resolve much finer detail, much fainter objects and things much further away. Um, as, as we continue our sky surveys, we're finding more and more planets that could potentially be inhabitable. They could sustain life. And I think, for me, working in astronomy is, is that's the quest.